Um, welcome, everybody. Um, this is our usual Thursday um, seminars. Um, we're delighted to have Julian Sana um, here from the University of Geneva. Um, and Julian's been doing uh, a lot of work recently um, on quantum chaos and wormholes. And uh, today he's going to tell us about causal symmetry breaking. Julian, it's yours. All right. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jeff, for inviting me. Um, it's really uh, very nice to talk to you about this subject. So um, let me just go right into it. So um, let me also arrange all of you in such a way that I can also see my slides. Very good. So um, I would like to report on um, a body of work which I've been developing with a lot of great people. Um, sort of one very important input came indeed from Alexander Altland and his group in Cologne, who is a world expert on quantum chaos. And maybe you know, what we learned from him, some of it I would like to also transmit to you and, and phrase its relevance in terms of gravity. And so in particular, so I'm going to talk about a paper that I wrote with Alex uh, and then um, where we talk essentially about issues that relate to energy, spectral issues. And, and then more recent works um, in which we extend what we learned about the spectrum to also be able to talk about operators. So this is again with Alex and Dima in Cologne and with Pranjal and Manuel here in Geneva. And finally, I would like to tell you about some um, ideas uh, with Jan de Boer and Alex Berlin, as well as Pranjal about uh, what this means for CFTs in particular. And I think in the background, I'll also be talking pretty much an ongoing work, which is not yet published. So. Um, let me first give you the main idea of why there should be such a connection um, between certain aspects of quantum chaos and what uh, the community has been talking quite um, intensely about recently, namely the problem of black hole information and also uh, the role that uh, um, Euclidean wormholes have to play in it. So it doesn't come as news to you when I tell you that uh, quantum mechanical unitarity and gravitational physics haven't gotten on very well over the last 40 years or so. And two famous examples are the original example that alerted us to this problem, which came from Hawking, of course, that we know as the black hole information problem, um, and more maybe sharply formulated in the form of the page curve, which is a sort of a model of what a unitary system would behave like and um, contrasted with the way that a gravitational system naively at least actually behaves. Then also um, another way of, of talking about this tension between unitarity and gravitational physics um, is essentially by focusing on the long time behavior of um, simple observables such as even two point functions of uh, simple operators. And so basically, uh, both of these and others have in common that they arise, they, they, they pose um, problems, they uh, are paradoxes, because we attempt to interpret black holes as thermodynamic entities. That, of course, goes back to Bekenstein and Hawking, and that is to say that black holes, in some sense, to be made precise, of course, represent thermodynamic ensembles. And so we know from pretty much all other areas of physics, that thermalization is a subtle and interesting problem, but one that can be understood. So the question of course being, how does a generic initial state thermalize eventually? And the question is, in what sense can we uh, describe systems as thermodynamic ensembles, even though they have been subject to uh, unitary quantum evolution and they may have been started out in pure states. Now, um, the strategy, therefore, that I've been adopting is that I study this question of quantum thermalization in particular for gravitational systems, and it has been very fruitful, I think, to study it at all the different char characteristic timescales that actually arise. And all of these characteristic timescales of quantum thermalization actually mean something interesting um, about the black hole. And today, what I would like to talk about is essentially long time quantum chaotic signatures. So um, talking about what we know, what, what we refer to as quantum ergodicity. So um, the model calculation here, or well, I'm saying it's a model calculation. This is something also that I did in, a while ago 
with uh, Tom Hartman, Tarek Anus, and Antonin Rovai. The idea is that in, in when we want to talk about thermalization and its relation to black hole physics, ADS-CFT is really a perfect laboratory because you can explicitly make the following mathematical experiment. You can say that, let me realize my gravitational system holographically. So holographically means that we talk about ADS physics and I'm uh, visualizing ADS here as this cylinder, the tin can. And I can explicitly ask what happens if I prepare this system in a highly excited state what happens is that this highly excited state will eventually thermalize, and we've already said the thermal state should be the black hole. And then the process in which it thermalized can be directly translated into, say, the collapse of matter, uh, creating some um, highly dense region, creating a horizon and forming a singularity. And then, you know, actually asking about how does it really work in practice? And, um, you know, what can we say? Um, how does the information loss, for example, seeming information loss get resolved in the setup is precisely the kind of questions that we want to explore. Now, um, what has been happening recently to me is very exciting because both of these examples that I mentioned have enjoyed what I consider to be really spectacular progress, but in doing so, as is often the case, generated new kinds of questions. And so one of the most intriguing and the one I want to focus on today concerns what uh, we like to refer to as the role of the ensemble. So it turns out that gravity contains contributions, uh, geometries that we call wormholes, um, which are extremely useful in addressing these paradoxes that I uh, mentioned. But these contributions, their existence strongly suggests actually that there is an average over an ensemble of quantum systems going on. And so to my mind, um, for having discovered this, we can have two attitudes. The first one is the one which I think was first proposed, namely that this ensemble is in fact fundamental, meaning that we should revise our understanding of ADS-CFT duality, or maybe gravity even in general. And we should say that the bulk theory is actually dual not to one boundary system, but to an ensemble of boundary systems. So that would be really a radical uh, departure from what we think of as ADS-CFT uh, to date. But the second is that in fact, this ensemble itself is not really a fundamental property, but it becomes a useful way of describing certain properties of dual systems. So in that sense, it's just a useful tool. I, I'm calling it here emergent because as you will see, I will tell you how thinking about disorder or quantum chaotic dynamics, we can produce these ensembles uh, in some sense dynamically. And that's why I'm calling it emergent. But the point number two is that um, the ensemble really is just a useful tool to describe certain aspects of the system. And those are the aspects that I will um, explain to you now. So I don't know how much you guys have been paying attention to this um, or even worked on this. So this might be very uh, uh, basic to you, but I do want to tell you the basic relationship between wormholes and ensembles in just a couple of transparencies in a non-technical way. By the way, um, I, I, I hope it's obvious that you should feel free to ask questions at any point, um, including now. But of course, the introduction was quite general, so I hope to you know, fill in on the details uh, of, of all those things which sound maybe now a little bit ill-defined, but we will get there. Right, so, so yeah. Can, can I take the opportunity then? Of course. Um, <clears throat> so how, how then should we think of you know, the canonical ADS-CFT correspondence of ADS-5 and super Yang models? Yeah. So um, my opinion is that uh, you should think of, well, actually, may, may, maybe let me explain this and then I, then I can, extra, you can actually exp, um, answer your question with the, the right background, if that's okay. Sure. So a couple more slides and then we'll actually get there. Cool. So one of the basic tenets of ADS-CFT as we know it, so for example, n equals to four is ADS five times S five, is that, you define, for example, um, the configuration that you want to consider your boundary theory in. So for example, 
I would like to compute the partition function of my boundary system Z of the QFT at some inverse temperature beta. That means in practice that I want to consider my, my, my quantum field theory uh, on a torus. So let's for simplicity think about the one plus one dimensional example. So I have a Euclidean torus with a Euclidean time that is uh, periodic with the inverse temperature beta. And then ADS-CFT tells you, well, you can compute this actually by mm, not doing directly this computation in the QFT, but by doing a gravity computation. And the gravity computation geometrically can be understood as understanding the geometries and their fluctuations that fill this boundary. So there's now a three-dimensional manifold which fills, uh, which has um, um, this torus here as its boundary. And of course, in the case of the torus, it is just the solid torus. So the infilling gravitational manifold is the solid torus that fills out the two-dimensional torus that I drew here. That's well known and has been used a lot to study, for example, the thermodynamics of holographic quantum field theories and uh, very successfully. But from this, it follows quite obviously that if I want to calculate the product of a partition function at inverse temperature beta one times the partition function at inverse temperature beta two, well, uh, my boundary is now the product of two of these tori. So the infilling manifold should be a manifold that ends on the product of two tori. So the answer uh, is uh, obviously the product of these two manifolds. But actually it is not true because there are more than just these infilling manifolds. So it's not obvious that this is the answer. In fact, one needs to be more careful. And what happens is that there is really more than one infilling manifold. There is the one where I just take the product of the two um, solid tori, but then there also exist manifolds which have two of these torus boundaries, but which are not the product of two solid tori. So they connect, if you want, through a three-dimensional bulk, two different two tori. And those geometries are what we call two boundary wormholes, but they're just examples of what in general we, we call Euclidean wormholes, because in some sense, they connect this boundary to this boundary, right? They connect these two boundaries. And they are known to exist as solutions of um, gravity in ADS since the work of Maldacena and Maus. But what it means is that you see, if it were the case that only these kind of manifolds exist, then the gravitational prediction would be that indeed, if I calculate the partition function with the boundary condition that I have two tori, then it would just factorize. It would be Z of B1 times Z of B2 calculated from the gravitational picture. But in fact, I have this other contribution which adds to what I had before. And so it spoils the factorization. So this is informally meaning that the seemingly the product of two partition functions, if I calculate it in gravity, it is not the same as the partition function calculated in gravity times the partition function calculated in gravity. So in other words, the gravitational, the gravitational computation does not factorize. And that poses um, an obvious problem from the point of view of the quantum field theory, because you can ask yourself, how could this ever arise? And so this is now where I'm going to be able to ask uh, Jeff's question. So people say the partition function doesn't factorize. So we can actually say the partition function, of course, is just the uh, inverse Laplace transform. Sorry, that is the Laplace transform of the spectral density, right? I can write Z of beta is integral of rho of E e to the minus beta E integrated over energy. So this non-factorization of the partition function is actually one and the same thing as non-factorization of the spectral density of our system. Again, when I calculate it from the gravitational point of view. And then what we say is with our experience, we say that if I think about this from a field theory point of view, this kind of non-factorization is not a feature of an individual theory, but in fact, it's a feature of ensembles of theories. And so I might from that uh, deduce that our one gravitational bulk theory is actually dual to an ensemble of boundary theories. So here I'm saying it, the question is, is the theory of ADS gravity therefore dual to an ensemble of boundary theories and not just a single one? And my answer is no. And the point is that these correlations, so this is now answering Jeff's question, but in some sense, the whole rest of my talk will be a longer version of that. 
these correlations, um, these types of correlations can actually arise meaningfully in single theories. So even in n equals to four super young mills, if you want, there are observables which capture precisely um, correlations between the spectrum. And these observables are basically observables that probe the quantum chaotic nature, the ergodic nature of the system. And what the existence of these gravitational geometries for the dual of n equals to four says, they simply give you a way of extracting those quantum chaotic correlations in the spectrum, which are present universally in any theory that actually has an ergodic limit. And the fact that these correlations are present in any theory um, in the ergodic limit is what I will establish. And I will also establish hopefully that the bulk analog of this, this is, this is a question of time, of course, but um, I will want to argue that the bulk analog of this is that we can find these kind of wormhole contributions even in um, the dual of n equals to four. So Jeff, you don't need to uh, say that what we thought about n equals to four is wrong. In fact, we should replace it by an ensemble of theories that are like n equals to four. No, we can keep our n equals to four theory, but we add another entry to our holographic dictionary. And this entry basically allows us to understand the quantum ergodic regime of n equals to four. Okay. Thanks. And so um, this uh, in some sense is uh, not new. Um, quantum chaos people knew about these kind of things before. In fact, in some sense, it's the whole content of quantum chaotic universality. And I will try to explain that. By the way, Jeff might remember this from his PhD days when, when I was teaching and they told us, you know, one of the things you should never do is quote something in Latin to your students. But now, you know, I guess I have progressed so I can do what I want. So I like this, you know, this is from, this is, well, difficult to, to, to actually say who it said, said it first, maybe Shakespeare said it first, maybe Dumas, but it is also the unofficial uh, motto of Switzerland. So this is Latin for one for all, all for one, you know, the musketeers and so on. But what I want to say is that precisely n equals to four, one theory can look like many, you know, can look like an ensemble. And in the same sense, an ensemble contains similar contribution as one individual theory. And this is, this is basically my philosophy here. So I will develop a framework that allows to understand the emergence of this ensemble using an effective field theory. And it actually turns out, sorry. Sorry, can I, can I ask another question? Yeah. Um, so, so, okay, cool. So, so I, I, I like this, 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 this philosophy because I guess, you know, the, the, the poll that was taken at strings that asked, is gravity an ensemble or not? You know, can yes. we decide 50, 50, democracy? Right? Um, is then not really a meaningful question because it's, it's, it becomes a question of how you ask the question, right? Um, it's, it's, it's what sector of the theory you're probing that it looks a particular way. So for example, if you ask, you know, I guess we have been asking for many years now um, questions about N equals four super Yang Mills type 2B string on ADS5 as integrable theories, but this is really a you know a set of measure zero in the theory space of of, of this of this theory, right? Correct. So I, I agree with you. Yeah. Um, so I would say it maybe uh, slightly differently than also my statement is that so far we have not seen evidence that would would that would necessitate the introduction of an ensemble. So. So this is taking your question a little bit further. So, you know, eventually it is true that there is a difference between a theory that truly is an ensemble and a quantum chaotic theory. But everything that we've seen so far can be still explained within the framework of just one quantum chaotic theory. And I hope to, to, to get to, you know, all, all the evidences that we have and how I can explain them by just looking at one theory. All right, but it is still possible. So, you know, we should, I, 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 I should still be open-minded. It is in the end true that there are differences, but they are very small. So you see, the question is maybe analogous to the, to the, to the thermalization question. You see a pure state can be effectively thermal, 
But, but that means that, for example, the density matrix, the reduced density matrix in a pure state can look like the reduced density matrix in a thermal state, but up to corrections which are exponentially small in entropy. So for questions which have exponential entropy, uh, exponential accuracy in entropy, you can actually still distinguish the two. But maybe you would say at that point, operationally, you cannot. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Yeah, so, so then, so. But, but so far, what we have seen, um, so these wormhole contributions in gravity, they are fully well explained just by saying you have one n equals to four theory and we're looking at quantum ergodic physics. So what about, you know, so then how, is it the statement that, that I can start off with, with some, some field theory, some say, say take some, some family of CFTs. And, and I'm thinking here about the Narain family, for example, right? Yes. So I can start off with some family of CFTs and I can certainly do an average of them over the ensemble of, of, of these theories. And I'll get right. something that looks like, like a theory of gravity. But your statement is, you know, if we take this story and go back to ADS CFT and uh, to ADS5 uh, Super Yang Mo's, that you, you need not do that. And, and you don't need to do that. Okay. And in fact, you know, you should already get a little bit nervous when you talk about these Narine CFTs, because as you go up in dimensions, it becomes less and less obvious how to actually do ensembles over theories. And so in N equals to four, for example, I, I don't know that we have of any candidate ensemble that we could even embed N equals to four in. So in these Narine CFTs, we're sort of able to do it in two dimensions. So in two dimensional bulk ADS2 and CFT1, there we really know how to do it. And so in, in ADS3 CFT2, we already don't really know how to do it. Although there may be a more definite answer as time goes on, people are certainly working on it. But then you go to four dimensional, uh, you know, and ADS5, we don't even have any candidate examples how this could work. What are you gonna, what are you gonna average over? Right. Yet the, bulk con yet the bulk story is the same in all of these dimensions. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So if you can actually explain what has happened in lower dimensions, as I'm claiming I am able to, without having to resort to these ensembles, then, you know, I think that's a very attractive option. Great, thanks. Right, so, um, so I will basically tell you all of these um, universal aspects of quantum chaos, which I claim to be captured by these wormholes in terms of a symmetry breaking principle. And this is sort of the main technical a new thing that I developed with uh, Alex Altland. And so I want to advertise that this is interesting conceptually because precisely the discussion I just had with Jeff, it explains the role of the ensemble and in particular wormholes for just individual theories. But it is also um, impressively efficient technically because it uh, allows you to do calculations uh, in regimes that you previously thought were inaccessible. And in particular, it actually has a resolution an energy resolution which is indeed exponentially good in entropy and you'll see precisely how i mean that so we can make specific quantitative predictions um, regarding random matrix type physics that arises from individual theories eigenstate thermalization hypothesis and i will also talk about some randomness conjectures and OPE coefficients which we can at least to some extent establish so let me tell you what this effective field theory is, and then I will actually want to tell you about this second application. I've given these, this kind of talk a few times before, and I've always talked about spectral correlations and never got to two. So I thought maybe today I will tell you about the second application, which is the more recent one actually in our list of papers. So here now comes the, really the, critical, uh, the critical conceptual insight, which is an old insight. It's basically due to Wigner and Dyson and people like Meta um, so uh, let's actually ask what is a, so, the, so in, 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 and also in our field, there have been many um, usages of the word quantum chaos. I'm, I now want to talk about a very specific one and one that's maybe the most universal. So what does it actually mean for a system to be chaotic, a quantum system to be chaotic? Well, one of the ways of establishing this was suggested by Wigner. So let us ask the following question. We take an energy level of our system. Let it, for example, historically be a complicated nucleus. And now I ask the following question. S is basically a measure of energy, okay? Um, 
S is, is the energy measured in mean level spacing density. Sorry, I also closed the window. There's too much traffic here. People are going home. Okay, so I go out in energy and I ask how many other levels do I actually encounter? And let's say I fix some bin size and I say, well, here I encounter like one level, uh, well, normalized, let's say, okay, I normalize it. I, I, I translate it into a probability density. And um, so here I, I've encountered some number of levels, then up to this energy, I've encountered more energy levels and so on. And I make this histogram. Then the question that was asked to Wigner was, what would actually the limiting distribution be if I just took um, infinitely many bins that have infinitely small size? And he su suggested, um, I don't know what his motivation was, it's sort of a flash of genius. He suggested this curve, this, this continuous purple curve, which we know as Wigner's surmise. So it turns out that how did he actually calculate this curve? Well, he actually asked, what would the level spacing distribution be if I asked, if I drew, drew my Hamiltonian at random from a Gaussian probability distribution? So this is what we, what we now know as the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. And lo and behold, it actually turns out that the really individual quantum chaotic systems, such as, for example, a chaotic billiards as the Sinai billiards, they actually approximate arbitrarily closely this Wigner law. Okay, so the energy levels of a quantum chaotic system quite universally follow this Wigner law. And you see, um, I'm saying here on a scale of a few delta, so delta is the average level spacing. What is that? So I take the total number of levels, they have some width, and um, then the average level spacing will be the total width divided, divided by the total number of levels. So it's something like e to the minus entropy, okay? And so I have the highest probability of finding another level if I'm approximately one mean level spacing from my original level, but then there is a specific law that is quantitative and that is obeyed by quantum chaotic systems. So that's, that's quite remarkable. So in other words, here we have it in a, in a nutshell, what happens, right? The statistics of the level spacing distribution of a quantum chaotic system is arbitrarily well approximated by the statistics of an ensemble, okay? Now, this translates into precisely the kind of quantities that we've been looking at in our field. Namely, if I take roughly the Fourier transform into the time domain of this, of this thing here, um, I get what is called the spectral form factor. And the spectral form factor contains um, a universal part that I also here uh, drew in, uh, in uh, purple, which is just the direct Fourier transform of this curve, roughly speaking. It's, it's not really the Wigner surmise. The Wigner surmise is the marginalized uh, uh, energy two-level correlation function, and I actually take just a two-level correlation function. So they're slightly different, but you see they're very closely related. And this leads to the ramp and plateau structure that is seen in many correlation functions. And there are deviations now at some time in which a realistic system will deviate from this universal RMT prediction. And this is in some sense, early time physics. I will tell you also how to understand this early time physics. But sooner or later, in particular after what is known as the Taoist time in the quantum chaos literature, a generic quantum chaotic system will start to look exactly like the purple curve. And this purple curve is basically what is captured by random matrix theory, okay? So I reveal the universal content of random matrix theory as I evolve in time in the spectral form factor. And so aspects of the spectral form factor can be understood by thinking about ensembles. Okay, and so what I want to show you is that the universal content of the spectral form factor can instead of just saying that it's approximated by random matrices, it can in fact be understood by looking at our individual system and showing that there is an effective field theory that comes out, which precisely gives me this uh, purple part of the spectral form factor and actually also allows me, by the way, to understand this sort of region as well. But I don't know if I have time to, to go there. So let me explain to you how this works, okay? 
So the main idea, of course, of symmetry breaking is the following. So the spectral density itself seems to be a very important uh, quantity that we, that we want to understand. I can write the spectral density as the difference between the advanced propagator and the retarded propagator across the real axis. So um, non-zero spectral density along a finite interval means that there has to be a branch cut in G plus or alternatively G minus. So that means that along um, on either side of this branch cut, this function G cannot be the same. So if the spectral density is non-vanishing along a, final, a, a finite interval, then G plus cannot give the same answer as G minus. And the idea of um, our approach is that we can actually understand this difference in terms of a spontaneous symmetry breaking, such that there is actually an effective field theory that allows us to calculate G pluses and G minuses, and that has a mean field approximation, which um, can, may or may not, um, have different expectation values for G plus as it has for G minus. If it has different expectation values, then causal symmetry is broken. If it does not, then causal symmetry is intact. And in the phase of broken causal symmetry, which arises for quantum chaotic systems, I precisely uh, recover this, this ramp plateau structure, for example, in the spectral form factor. Now, here I have written these overbars, and this is a potential source of confusion because now you're saying, but, but you're averaging again, because this means this is some averaging. But I have actually explained to you what this averaging means for individual theory. It means, for example, this procedure of choosing some small bin width and then sampling the distribution. So the averaging that I'm doing here is actually just, I take the level spacing distribution of a realistic system like for example, n equals to four, but I ask statistical questions about it. I'm always allowed to do that. I'm just sampling the signal if you want, okay? And this sampling the signal is basically the preferred way of, prefer of understanding this overbar for an individual system. But I could also think of it more physically if you guys prefer that. I could also say, for example, I think of it as some sort of coarse grain. You know, an observer might not actually have infinite energy resolution, so they can't actually do any better than doing some kind of average here. Or if I want, I can also say, realistically speaking, um, I might actually want to consider n equals to four theory and an average over just the Toft coupling parameter, because maybe, again, this is not fully determined because there's some disorder there. Or another example is SYK, where I also average over a coupling. Um, and you know, th this is another example in which you can stabilize such an effective field theory. But the point is that whatever your interpretation of this overbar, there will be a particular symmetry breaking scheme and therefore the resulting physics is universal. You see, this is just like say the pions. Once somebody explains to you chiral symmetry, then the microscopic construction is not that important because the physics follows from the effective description, namely the chiral Lagrangian. And I will construct for you now the chiral Lagrangian of quantum chaos. And this is why now it is such a strong result because it allows you to understand what has happened previously where people explicitly averaged, say for example, in the SSS matrix model, but also, if you putatively apply this effective field theory to n equals to four, you see the predictions will be the same within the range of the effective field theory because it's just the symmetry that actually gives us everything, okay? So if that was a little bit abstract um, um, or you don't like uh, the point of view, let, let me say it in a little bit more detail and maybe then you see what I mean. So, it, but was that was that more or less clear, or is there some? Okay, sounds like things are more or less clear. Yeah, that was great. So um, I uh, so um, I want to start by calculating the spectral form factor. This is not the be all and end all. You could calculate other quantities, but this is one that people like. And the way that I want to do it is I want to actually use a generating function for this. So this will actually allow me to calculate these spectral um, correlations. 
And this works why? This works because you see, I have here a ratio of four determinants. Z, the Zs are like energies and H is the Hamiltonian of my system. So think of it if you want as the Hamiltonian of SYK or maybe N equals to four. Now, if I, if I take a derivative with respect to one of these energies, then um, I, I produce a factor that is the determinant times the trace of one over Z1 minus H. I mean, I've taken the Z1 derivative. And this is precisely the spectral resolvent. This is basically rho. The imaginary part of trace of one over Z minus H is rho of Z, is the spectral density at energy Z. So by differenti differentiating with respect to these energies, I can um, get basically my determinant times what I want, namely the, the, the spectral density. And so therefore I've written the determinants in the denominator so as to normalize, right? So then I can in the end cancel determinant over determinant by setting the energies to be equal after I've done the differentiation. So this thing indeed allows me to um, um, think about things like rho or rho times rho, or if I had even more determinants, you know, any number of rows. Now I start with what is basically a completely trivial trick. I, real, I realize that in quantum systems, I can write determinants as Gaussian integrals. So the determinant of Z1 minus H is just the Gaussian integral over a fermion. Fermions give determinants, bosons give one over determinants, where the integral kernel is Z1 minus H. So I can exponentiate this ratio of determinants by having a vector which has fermionic components for this determinant and this determinant and bosonic components for this determinant and that determinant. And so this gives me a Gaussian integral, which is a sense, in some sense over four copies of the Hilbert space, one, two, three, four. And psi is a graded vector where L is actually the dimension of the Hilbert space. And I have two L fermionic bosonic directions and two L fermionic directions. And that's just the structure of this determinant. Now, I've put a plus and minus here. This means I want to continue this into the upper half plane and this into the lower half plane. And the reason is actually because I want to have plus and minus propagators in the end. This is the same plus and minus signs actually that I have here. So what is interesting is that this Hamiltonian here has just been quadrupled, but it's the same Hamiltonian. It's still our same system. So this means that if I briefly ignore the energies, this system has an exact rotational symmetry rotating the four Hamiltonians into each other. And this turns out to be a symmetry, which is a U2 slash two symmetry because it acts on, you know, um, um, again, bosonic and fermionic parts of this vector psi. So there is a sub sector of these vectors, namely the U2 slash U, which I can exactly rotate and this integral will be invariant under it. However, the symmetry is in fact weakly explicitly broken because if the energies in each of the sectors are different, then all four sectors are no longer equivalent and I can't do this rotation. So if I have non-zero energy differences, then the symmetry is explicitly broken. But I'm interested in energy differences which are tiny because I want to look about, talk about individual energy levels. So therefore this is a small explicit breaking and this is now precisely the same uh, scenario as you have in QCD, where you have small quark masses which break the chiral symmetry. But the, the, you know, the effective theory of pions is still extremely accurate because the quark masses are very small compared to the uh, actual uh, spontaneous breaking of the symmetry. And this is also what happens here. If I actually analyze this theory, I find that its expectation values for um, plus and minus traces um, are different and it breaks this U2 slash two symmetry into these two parts, U1 slash one times U1 slash one. And this breaking is much stronger than this um, explicit breaking. And so I can use now the technology that we learned from Callan, Coleman, Vess and Zumino in the 1960s to write down precisely the Goldstone theory that comes from this symmetry breaking and that Goldstone theory will be my, my universal theory that I want to talk about. So the Goldstones of the symmetry breaking are, is basically the effective theory of quantum chaos. And it reproduces, this is what was known by the way in the condensed matter community, reproduces the physical content of random matrix theory 
Um, what I'm doing here is I'm generalizing it to strongly coupled many body systems. And in particular, I also want to show you that these correlations of the Goldstone bosons precisely are the wormhole correlations in the bulk. And this is really a one-to-one -one mapping. So the Goldstone physics basically comes thanks to these authors by now constructing a quantum theory that lives on the coset space, which is our original symmetry, divided out by the symmetry that remains intact. So I, I integrate over the geometric symmetric superspace u2 slash 2 over u1 slash 1 times u1 slash 1, and q is my uh, variable that parameterizes this geometry. And this gives us a very efficient way of packaging basically um, the resulting physics. Okay, so this is again the um, this is how it works for pion physics since the 1960s. So we should actually compare the chiral condensate, so the quark quark condensate, with what I call the causal condensate, um, which is basically an expectation value for these psi's here. Okay, and that from translates into an expectation value of these g's. And maybe I should also say, excuse me, why do we actually talk about causal symmetry? Well, because in actual fact, you rotate causal sectors into each other, okay? This is, this is the point. Um, this symmetry is a continuous version of being able to rotate what I would call advanced degrees of freedom, meaning this determinant into what I call retarded degrees of freedom, namely this. And when it's broken, then you can no longer do it. And this is why we call it breaking of causal symmetry. So that's why also why I call it the causal condensate. And then there is of course uh, the, 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 the analogy between the quark mass M in, the, in, 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 in QCD and the energy difference delta Z. And as I said before, we want energy differences to be at the level of individual energy level differences. And so this is like E to the minus entropy of our system. Okay, so now this is, this is uh, the, the overview, somewhat more technical. Of course, uh, actually constructing this, this, this QFT um, is a little bit, um, well, it's, it's nice, but it's a bit of work, but it really is standard techniques. You can use standard effective field theory techniques, this coset model of Kalman, Coleman, Vess, and Zemino. So I don't want to go too much into those details because we don't have time. And I hope that maybe you've all seen these kind of constructions before. But what I do want to tell you is how does actually, how do, how do the diagrammatics of this theory actually look? What do they look like? Unless you have some questions now. So the, the way of thinking about this is now that you know, we have our symmetry breaking um, mean fields and now we perturb around those vacua. And it turns out that the degree of freedom, the, the, the pions, if you want, are actually still matrix degree of freedoms, but they are small matrix degree of freedoms. In fact, they are four by four matrices. Why are they four by four matrices? That's because of this original, this is a four by four unitary supersymmetry here. So these are very small matrices. Nevertheless, I can do the, what I do with matrix field theories. I can do um, my fat graph expansion and I can associate to every matrix model diagram, I can actually uh, associate a Riemann surface. And it turns out that the perturbation theory of this effective field theory goes like this. There's one saddle point, which has action that is strictly zero. This little s is just energy differences in measured in mean energy level spacings. And this is the natural perturbation parameter of this, of this effective field theory. The first contribution is a cylinder diagram where I have one red boundary and one blue boundary, which basically is the plus boundary and the minus boundary. So these, if you want, these are just labels. I label this boundary by the plus sign because it corresponds to an energy that was continued in the upper half plane. And this is an energy that was continued in the lower half plane. And S is the difference of those two energies you want. You know, omega is energy one minus energy two. So this is a cylinder. Well, it turns out that the first contribution is a cylinder with one handle. It's a Riemann surface that has two boundaries, but one handle and so on. So you get the genus G contribution with two boundaries. 
And then, um, very interestingly, there's actually a second uh, mean field that also breaks this, uh, this, 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 this causal symmetry. And it has a similar expansion with slightly different values of these diagrams, but they have the same topological expansion. So you can actually uh, arrange the effective matrix model into a Toft-like expansion, and you recover precisely the same terms that, for example, SSS recovered from their re rewriting of JT. And each of these topologies now, for in this effective field theory, will predict the value of some diagram that you might want to calculate in the effective matrix model. So because our CFT is really fully predictive, sorry, our EFT. And so what you might want to do is you might want to actually to compare the predictions of this theory with what has been calculated, for example, by SSS. Now, um, I don't know how much I want to say about this because as I said, I wanted to talk about the second part, but um, let me just tell you that um, it does of course work. Okay, so this is maybe the best thing to say is that our effective field theory diagram, this diagram here, if I actually do all the um, Feynman rules and so on, its value is minus one over two times the energy difference squared. And now I go back to, for example, the double trumpet and I ask, what does this uh, double trumpet actually give us in terms of energy difference? It gives us precisely minus one over two S squared plus a bunch of regular terms, which I can, uh, which I can ignore for technical reasons. So this coefficient minus one over two is precisely correct. I can go and I can look, for example, at three dimensional cases where people have wormholes. And I can ask what is the leading energy singularity of the three dimensional torus, torus wormhole as, been, as has been calculated by Kotler and Jensen. I go to the result and I find once I've normalized it again by the right level density, right? This gives me little s. The coefficient is again, minus one over two. Uh, we have uh, done the calculation in minimal strength theory where the the, the what, what we would call the Euclidean wormhole is actually called an FZZT annual, annulus diagram. Again, we look at the leading singularity, it's minus one over two times S squared. So fully predictive, fully correct. So this led us to conjecture at this point that this leading EFT diagram always captures the, um, the uh, coefficient that you get from the, um, genus zero bulk wormhole. Now um, I have, um, maybe I'll get back to why, you know, I, I can argue better why this should be the case. Maybe for you now, this sounds a little bit fast, but there are actually um, more solid ways of describing why this works in particular in minimal strength theory, which is in my paper with Alex Altland where we map this out entirely. And so it is not actually a coincidence. Okay, the, the, we know why it works. Um, but what I wanted to point out is that this effective field theory, again, it would work for a single, um, let's say a single sample of the SSS model, right? You could also ask, Steve Schenker often asks that, what would help happen if you take a single uh, matrix sampled from the SSS distribution? Well, what we would say is there is um, a contribution in this system, which gives rise to the linear ramp and this contribution of the linear ramp is captured by the bulk wormhole. And it's also captured by the leading perturbation of our effective field theory, this term. Uh, you can yeah. ask about the subleading once, and I could tell you a story about those two, but yes, please go ahead. Yeah, sorry. So, um, so you're saying this uh, leading EFT diagram is dual to the, this bulk wormhole. Is there a notion where um, this uh, EFT language, this EFT diagrams can be related to? Uh, holographic complexity? Uh, yes, I, I believe so. I mean, um, or rather, so you might want to calculate other quantities than the spectral form factor. I mean, I'm going through the computation of this quantity here for simplicity. But if you were to calculate something like complexity, and by the way, there was a recent paper by uh, Gabo Sharoshi, Mark Metze, and I think a third JD also. Sorry? The JD gravity context, right? Uh, the, right. Uh, and so, so they will also find uh, things like um, a ramp and a plateau structure in those observables. And they will also be caused by basically the pion mediating in a correlation between two of these determinants. So the physics is the same, but the actual observable is somewhat different. 
And so, of course, um, the computation would not be exactly the same diagram, but it would be using these ingredients to produce something very similar, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thanks. So let me, let me maybe illustrate that by calculating one other quantity, which is quite interesting. Um, the, I, should, I should say, um, I want to make one remark, which is rather important, which is that I've shown you the smooth curve of the spectral form factor. But what actually happens is that that smooth curve is only the mean of the statistical distribution. But as I have told you at the beginning, we should think of the all statistical measures of the level spacing distribution. So right now we've looked at, say, the mean and its variance. But we might also want to calculate higher moments. And we can do it using the same um, framework. And it gives you some prediction. And this prediction would be that you have this smooth curve and around it, you have some erratic fluctuations and we could quantify what these erratic fluctuations are. Roughly speaking, after the Taulis time, the prediction is that they are the same uh, moments as you would get from a certain random matrix distribution. Okay, but again, this is for our individual system. And I've derived it by using this effective field theory applied to the individual system. The output would be, what I just said, that it behaves as if it were a random matrix, um, including its fluctuations. So let me tell you another, another interesting uh, set of observables that you might want to consider, which um, follows from what we call wave function statistics. So what we showed is that there is a statistical way of understanding the energy eigenvalues, right? And we looked, looked at the two-point correlation, and we did not look at higher point correlations, although we could have. Another class is when you say, well, the eigen, the eigen energies actually come also with eigen functions. And so it is natural to uh, intuit that the eigen functions also have certain statistical properties that are inherited from this EFT. And in fact, this is the case. And what this allows us to do is to ask, for example, what happens to operators? Because operators, you know, they are just, uh, their matrix elements, of course, depend on the statistics of these psi's. And so one way of probing that is, for technical reasons, the kind of quantities that we can look at are always these resolvent type quantities. So we now talked about an energy resolvent and the determinant was a, was a way of generating correlations of it. We can generalize this somewhat. So the, re the, the resolvent that we looked at before only had sort of deltas in energies. Now I can dress these deltas in energies with matrix elements of operators. So this is a slightly more complex resolvent, um, but it is still computable. And in fact, it's fairly easily computable because you can go through the same procedure as I did now, but you add right, right from the beginning sources for the operator, and then you take also derivatives with respect to the sources of the operator at the right point in your calculation. And then you can get correlations of this kind. But the point is that because I can go through the essentially the same procedure and add only have to add these sources, again, the physics of these resolvents um, will be governed by causal symmetry breaking. And we have recently published a paper which uh, for some reason, I think is the first to basically uh, consider this, um, which found a very universal behavior also of operator correlation functions. And in particular, we find that there is something like, um, well, I didn't say this to you before, but the, uh, the purple part of the cur curve that I got here, the ramp and the plateau, is the Fourier transform of a function that had been first determined by um, Freeman Dyson, and it's called the sine kernel because it's basically the sinc function, you know, the sine of something divided, sine of x divided by x squared, where x is pi omega over delta. And this sine kernel is extremely famous and it is seen as one sort of universal sign signature of quantum chaos. And this series here, by the way, that I showed you can be seen in, a, in a, some sense as, as computing the sine kernel for you. So if I add these two. So this non-perturbative um, part to this, I get precisely Dyson sign kernel. So what we found is some sort of operator sign kernel and I'm writing it here. 
So it has some delta functions at the origin, but then it has precisely Dyson sine kernel, and it basically um, it basically multiplies just the variance of this operator, but just taken over the Hilbert space. This is something simple. Someone gives you the operator, you can of course calculate this, and we get some universal chaotic correlations that 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 multiply this if you want. So the traces here, uh, there should be capital um, uppercase traces. They can be like canonical traces or they can be uh, micro canonical traces or they can be projectors on any given eigenstate, okay? And so um, what does this mean? Well, for example, it allows us to calculate the very long time behavior of two point functions of operators. And lo and behold, as I think was of course known um, in SYK, those things also have some kind of ramp plateau structure, although it's not as clean as the ramp plateau was in the, uh, in the, in the, in the just purely spectral case. And so um, translating this operator sign kernel into the time domain gives us again, these universal contributions. Um, however, <clears throat> another motivation for this was that um, re recall that eigenstate thermalization also tells me something about the statistical properties of uh, matrix elements of some operator. And what we have done is we calculated basically um, this second term here uh, at the, at, for a few level spacings. And we found that it satisfies the uh, tenets of the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. But even better, we find actually that chaos quantum chaos predicts a universal form for this F. This F is basically just a rewriting, you know, sort of rearranging of the terms in this, in this sign kernel. And in this sense, it is very interesting because um, previously to our work, there were, I think, essentially two uh, uh, ways of thinking about these wormholes. There was, there was a Stanford way of thinking about the wormholes, which says this actually has to do with spectral statistics. You know, they wrote down a matrix model for the distribution of eigenvalues of the system. But then the, the UBC group actually had also suggested what actually these wormholes give you, they give you correlations, they of, they're of the type of the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, meaning random distributions of operator matrix elements. And what we're seeing here is that this effective field theory gives rise to both. If you just ask about spectral probes, it tells you about statistics of the spectrum, but you can also generate ETH type correlations um, as are required by these ideas of, of Pollack, Rosali, Sully, and Wakem. So that's quite satisfying. Now, um, I, I think in, in view of time, I won't emphasize this too much, but in a CFT, uh, this allows you to also ask about what are the statistics of OPE coefficients? Because after all, OPE coefficients are just if you want matrix elements of primary operators in states which are created by primary operators, but from a, from, a, from a technical point of view, they are actually the same class of correlations that we just talked about. And actually this randomness, a random distribution of operator product uh, um, um, Wilson coefficients had been uh, conjectured by Alex Berlin and Jan de Boer as being a way of thinking about ensembles of CFTs, right? So when we want to go to higher dimensions, maybe the first question we want to ask, how do we do it in one plus one CFT? And what Alex and Jan suggested was that maybe these um, Mulders and Maus type wormholes in, in three-dimensional bulk dual to two-dimensional CFT actually tells us about this order in these OPE coefficients. And it's quite natural to produce these, um, the, the, these, these correlations of precisely the right type um, using our ergodicity ideas. And so um, Jan and, and Alex and Pranjal and I wrote a paper about this recently, and it basically explains the non-factorization, um, the contribution of what people call the genus two wormhole, which is, I've written the metric here, but this is conceptually the same story that we said before. So there's a three-dimensional gravity solution, and it seems to tell you that the partition function in the genus two surface doesn't factorize and the amount by which it doesn't factorize um, is precisely computed by this wormhole. And it turns out that this is precise. So, so this is the gravitational prediction. The suppression is e to the minus three times the microcanonical entropy. We go through our effective field theory. Um, this is actually work in progress. We haven't yet published this. 
And we find precisely the same structure. We find that it's one plus, and then we have some coefficient here, times e to the minus three times the microcanonical entropy. And again, so that means that you don't actually need to average over your CFTs. This sort of operator randomness is implied simply by these general ergodicity wave function statistics. And so again, we match the gravity prediction. I wasn't actually too precise here about the coefficient. That's because we haven't attempted yet to match the coefficient. Uh, um, well, just, that's just the status. So I don't want to overpromise. So let me summarize. So um, the summary is basically that um, we should think very carefully about uh, when we talk about random matrix statistics, do, does, that, does that really mean that there has to be necessarily an ensemble behind all that? And what I have tried to show you is that um, you can actually rephrase uh, the implications after the Taulis time, let's say, of, uh, of, of ergodic quantum ergodicity. So the fact that the system becomes um, effectively chaotic by using this causal symmetry breaking idea. And this gives you immediately the idea of treating it as an effective field theory. So it explains conceptually why you have these ensemble type correlations for individual theories. It's just a consequence of chaotic dynamics. And as I told you, as I showed you, you can calculate all sorts of interesting things. And for example, as I got asked, you might also want to think about using this to compute complexity. There's just one, one other example. There are many others. It's fully non-perturbative, this framework, so I didn't actually insist on this too much, but these second contributions, the second saddle is actually what people in our community like to call as a doubly non-perturbative setup. And it comes out of this, comes out of this, 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 this effective field theory simply as a second saddle point. It's very intriguing that there is a simple geometric principle behind this, namely this coset space sigma model. And it turns out that you can actually allow you can actually classify all the allowed cosets, and um, which goes back to some nice mathematical work by Cartan. And it turns out that this classification coincides with the so-called altland zirnbauer classification of random matrix ensembles. That's something that was actually pointed out by Zirnbauer. <clears throat> now, the full signal, including its fluctuations for a physical system, can therefore be effectively said to be given by random matrix theory after the Taulis time. And so therefore ergodicity explains these wormholes without the need to resort to an ensemble. The biggest open issue, let me just say, is basically how, um, what is a nice way of thinking about this geometric structure of the sigma model just by thinking about bulk gravity. So we have some understanding of this in the context of minimal string theory. And one can read, reread the Saad Schenker Stanford paper um, in the light of, of our ergodicity story and think of that also as partial evidence. But the general story in particular in higher dimensions is not yet understood and I would love to understand it. So to phrase it with a precise question, the second saddle, which actually usually people call the Andreev Altula saddle, so AA, what is the universal description of this in bulk space times. And so in particular, how do we get it to work in high dimensions? So thanks for your attention. Sorry for taking a bit more of your time. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, thank you for the beautiful talk. Uh, are there questions, guys? Anyone? <clears throat> Nothing for me, that was, that was great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I, so I, I basically have a comment. So, so you, this this effective uh, effective uh, field theory of quantum chaos. Uh, so the one of the motivation was late, basically at least uh, that's what I uh, got from it. So it's to understand the late time behavior, right? Yes. Um, so in that sense, isn't um, I mean I'm again <laughs> uh, rephrasing quantum complexity because that's. I feel like a, a very a very powerful tool to understand the latent behavior of uh, maybe a chaotic system. Although uh, the the understanding of uh, quantum complexity as a tool for or as a diagnostic for quantum chaos is still not uh, complete, right? But it's right. Yes, I mean I've been I've been thinking about this issue in, in particular. Um, also, um, 
as relating to Krilov complexity. Um, I was I was about to say right that the the the, the 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 what is it called the thermal two point is dual to this. Um, yes. This so thing. so I think in so I think in Krilov complexity this this sort of uh, story is fairly immediate. Um, but uh, yes. Yeah, so I mean I I. In other words, I mean, I, I agree with what you say, but what I would say from my perspective is that what we have is in some sense a bigger structure because I, do, I don't really care very much which observable you calculate, whether it's a well-motivated form of complexity or whether it's the spectral form factor or whether it's operator correlation functions. The point is that because of this idea of, 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 of causal symmetry breaking, Mm -hmm. These universal features, namely the sort of rampant plateau, will in one way or another have their imprints in these observables. Right. So, I mean, so the EFT is basically the thing that, uh, you know, is, is the structure that you're looking for. And what you use the EFT to calculate with is up to you. But I should say for this, by the way, that um, there is... So that th there is still an enormous amount of work that needs to be done if you really want to prove that a given system is quantum chaotic. Oh, of course, yes, yes, yes sure. And I, I can maybe just make that comment because otherwise it sounds like maybe I was selling you something a little bit more than we actually did. So for example, the fact that cha chaotic systems behave at late times like random matrix matrices is in fact precisely what is called the uh, bohigas janoni schmidt conjecture. So they conjecture that a classically chaotic system, if you quantize it, its level spacing distribution at the scale of a few delta will be precisely this Wigner surmise. And this conjecture is still open. And so one can say, why does this kind of work, for example, not count as a proof of this conjecture? That's because um, we spent a lot of time and also Alex Altland with, with Dima Bagrets, for example, to prove that this effective field theory actually applies to SYK. And successfully, we were able to show that. Mm -hmm. But yes. if you not, if, if you just say, ah, we'll just apply it to n equals to four, well, that's nice. And from an effective field theory point of view, that's maybe great. But what happens if you by accident say that now it applies to a theory that's actually integrable? And so what you need to do in, in, in really to be rigorous in a given system is you need to somehow calculate the tau less time. You know? so, so what is the tau less time? And if you can find that the tau less time is finite, then you've won. But given a calculation, giving a calculation of a tau less time for a complicated system such as n equals to four is really still a daunting task. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> just, I just wanted to say that, I mean, I want to be of course, the, the, the person who says, well, yes, but effective field theory is ex powerful ex is, is essentially when you can't explicitly calculate things, and that's true. But if you wanted to be completely rigorous and you want to say, for example, this establishes the BGS conjecture, then, okay, now actually you have to say that, you know, what is the criterion? What's the tallest time for a given system? Mm -hmm. And so for SYK, we know it, and I actually wrote it somewhere. I, I skipped that slide, but uh, in general, and we don't actually know. So in SYK, we have a tallest time, which is square root n log n. Right. But for n equals to four, we don't know what that tallest time is. Right. And so let me just say one more thing. So you see, I could right. This was actually, this is one of the plot that, um, that clicked me because you know, this, this you know, linear growth and then the plateau is kind of the signature expectation from the complexity, <laughs> the quantum complexity. And, uh, Precisely. Yes. And I mean, I, I um, to be honest, I mean, also with my collaborators in this, uh, in this complexity work on Krilov complexity, I mean, we knew this, we just didn't really uh, get to writing it down. I mean, because it in some sense is obvious, once you realize that you can reduce it to the computation of a two point function, it is in, in, in a sense, just an application of what I already told you. Yeah. So what I wanted to say is that so I've basically in this talk only talked about when the signal really looks almost exactly like RMT. I see, yeah. But in fact, this technology allows you to study even early time deviations from RMT. And the technology is that you can basically not just have the Goldstone sector, but you also have a sector of massive modes above the Goldstone sector. 
and you can control those as well using similar techniques. And so I just want to say that we, we also have um, results on how at earlier times you get, you actually get systematic deviations from RMT. Sounds very powerful, yeah, okay. Are there any other questions? Okay. Uh, like, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, just saying. Thank you very much. That was that was excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, and uh, yeah. Um, Have a good time. Yeah. See you. Uh, uh, yeah, you yeah, soon. Yeah. I hope. Maybe even in real yes. life. Thanks. thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye.